right, ladies and gentlemen, we have David O'Connor here in the interview lounge. You can feel free to come on over and watch us chat with him. Um, first of all, thanks so much for taking the time out of your schedule to join me. No, well, thanks. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a good, it's a busy day today, obviously, but it's, uh, it's been fun. It's been great, and this is a great idea. Thanks for doing this. Well, so far this morning, there have been some great rounds here. Did you think that the course would kind of ride this well with that early group? And what are your thoughts on the rides you've seen so far? Yeah, I actually did it with it. it uh, and I thought the course would ride pretty well. You know, you cr Derek changed quite a bit a little bit at the beginning by we didn't know what the effect was of putting an extra hill into it by running into the infield and back into the water. And um, but I think with that then being quite softer on the end um, because uh, it's, it's actually amazing the difference how strong the horses are coming home. Yeah. Um, I thought they were tired here in the last couple of years. I know he was a little bit worried about that. He made the end a little softer. Um, and then it really seems like the horses are handling it well. But all the exercises are pretty straight in front of you. And, um, you know, and the good riders are making it look easy. And um, and it, as a typical four-star, you get a little bit of a cumulative thing that some little mistake early on, you actually pay for it later. Well, a lot of people making the time. I don't know if you were surprised about that. I think someone said that you, you thought there might be about seven go double clean, and we're we're getting close to that I number think we're already. At six already, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think you know with a with a footing the way it is, uh, the cool conditions, um, and again because it's more open at the end with less jumping efforts in the last three minutes. Um, I, yeah, I think it's allowed the guys to catch up time because they've been down up at the top, up at the quarry, uh, but they've been able to make that time back up. And um, it's nice to see the horses, you know, finish so well, um, you know, full of running, they're full of confidence, you know, and it's a good course um, for building on to the future for other four stars or championships. We were just talking about Caitlin Silman, first timer here at Rolex, and she made it look pretty good today. Um, her horse obviously catch a star, been through a lot of a traumatic experience. We had her and Boyd on the couch here the other day. For those of you who don't know, there was a horrible fire at True Prospect Farm, and that mare catch a star almost lost her life and um, has spent a lot of months rehabbing and, and getting back to work. So to see her out there today getting it done, yeah, it was fantastic. Special. I mean, you can actually see the scarring, you know, on her on her body from the fire um, but she uh, you know Caitlin's just brought her back uh, just on, on a steady uh, process and I thought she was fan she went out just hammering today <laughs> and uh, almost got a little bit caught at the beginning but then she just got into a really fantastic rhythm and, she, and really the mistake that she made up the quarry was just a really an inexperienced young rider mistake more than anything else I thought this will build her confidence in a huge way um, but she just got a little too quick coming into the coffin and into the quarry didn't make give them quite enough time and the mayor didn't get to see the question um, and that's a very much of an inexperienced mistake but I thought the rest of the round um, was class I mean true class so it's a great again great thing for building for the future where we're going to go it's always interesting to kind of whether riders choose to watch, to not watch, how many to watch before they go. Because if you go later on in the day, you've got a lot of time to kill and you want to be careful maybe to not let it affect your mental game too much. What's your take on that? And when you're riding a course like this, kind of what would you do? I mean, obviously not now being the rider you are, but um, for the, some of those youngsters, what advice do you give them as far as that's concerned? Well, I think from a coaching point of view, it's the same thing that I look after when I'm uh, you know, when you're telling your riders um, about whether an exercise works, I always look in the horse's eyes to see if the horse can understand it and do they read it. Um, and then if the horses can understand it, read it, and then, then they get it and they see the exercise soon enough, then all right, we just go. Now it's your job to, you know, get them there on the right canter, you know, in the right gallop, the right line, um, and then you, your instincts take over. But that's always the first thing is that the, see, is that the horse understand it. And I'm, so I'm always looking in the horse's eyes. And you can see around today, like some of the harder lines, um, some people have gone around some things that have been going around a little longer way at the coffin. Um, they're doing three strides here out of the water um, but and there's where there's a direct to there's more of a direct line at the coffin but I will say that every time that the horses are taking the direct line they've totally read it so like if we were in a championship situation you'd be going to our riders and said go for it I mean go go straight down the line the horses they see it they understand it so and, and go on down there um, and I think this course today is a great course for that aspect of that you, you're going to go forward to meet your to meet your you know the, to solve the problem you're not going to there's not there's only really one exercise that you're going up and down and that's the sunken road and the rest of it is you got to go get it and um, the horses are reading and understanding it and so that's always the thing if you're looking through the day that i'm looking for is that if the horses read it and then they go 
And with that coffin, we'll talk about the coffin complex for a second here. There's an option of a left-handed corner or a right-handed corner. The left-handed line is maybe a little more steep, that corner angle, than the right hand. And did you have a side that particularly when you walked with people, you you advised them on? Or how has that kind of unfolded through the day? It really depends completely. you got to know your horse, whether you know whether they have a little bit more of a right-left drift or a left drift. And so in knowing that, I totally, for me, it totally saw the left-hand side. And everybody that I've seen going on the left hand side because there's plenty of time there's four strides to it that the horses really understand it and i've never seen i haven't seen a horse on the left hand side even question um so i happen to like the left hand side um and I think, it, again, he's made it a little easier by backing it up a stride. If that was on a three-stride deal, you know, one stride sooner, I think that whole combination would be totally different. So this morning's group, maybe two or three that stood out to you? Um, well, certainly, um, you know, Lynn Szymanski with Donner, you know, I, I thought that he actually just got warmed up when he jumped the last fence. Um, and I thought he was ready to run around again. Um, that, that was class act. Look easy, fantastic rhythm, quick. Um, a fantastic horse, I think, for the future for where we're going to go. Lynn's a very classy, rhythmical rider. So, you know, uh, so for the Americans, I would say, Lynn, you know, that was great. I thought Buck did a great job with that Mara doing more because that's not the easiest but horse in the world. at the end there. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's that's a brave move. Yep. Um, but he did a good job with it. And um, that horse has had some issues in the past. And he went out and gave it a great ride. And I thought, actually, the horse got more more confidence as he went around. But I keep, even a couple of the newer ones, the younger ones, Katie Rupel had a great round yeah. all the way around. I mean, um, and quite fast and that's a big long horse and she just kind of kept going the same thing with daniel classing i mean i think it was another good ride and those guys are you know they're younger riders that are coming on and it was nice to see them gain a tremendous amount of experience and and uh you know confidence out of a course like this for for those for the younger guys um you know caitlin was very good you know philip i thought just did his professional round as he does you know with it that's a good jumper that fern hill eagle um you know and I thought William, and, and obviously watching William and Andrew, you know, that's, uh, it was good. It was interesting with William because I, the other horse has a shorter stride. And um, so he didn't get to go out there and go forward. He knew it. Um, and I thought the horse was actually a little bit backed up in the beginning. But as with most of those really, really good riders, you see that the horse came home better than he went out. And, he, you know, gained confidence as he went out. Um, I thought Andrew's just went. I mean, it was nice and it was great to watch and, you know, a little boring and, you know, just out for a Sunday hack. Um, but William had to work for it. And uh, so it's always fun to watch those top riders um, watch their horses and gain confidence as they're going around. These riders, too, if you're a first-time four-star rider, yourself being, being the new coach, David, do you kind of look to how they handle that pressure and, and do here in this big situation? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a part of the game is that, you know, do you ride your horse to the level and are you aggressive? And you can tell really in the first two fences, you know, whether somebody's going out there and they're ready to go get the exercises or they're just not quite sure and they're going to see how it goes. Um, and you really get that feeling right off the bat of what somebody's coming down. The first combination of those two edges, you get a feeling of whether somebody, I think this is going to be okay or whether, okay, this is what's going to work. And you're always going to be looking for the people that are going to say, not about the speed, but about the section, all right, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to do. And then after that, you're just totally looking for their instincts, you know, because it's an instinctual game once you get out there. James Allison, an interesting rider to point out because last year he came here coming off of a lot of success at the three-star level, a lot of wins on both those horses and came, he fell at fence two on Parker, the first one that went out today and didn't make it very far. Jumbo's Jake walked home and he's already gotten them both here. Parker clean, I think the fastest one of the day so far yeah. and um, and Jumbo's Jake getting around too, so maybe him doing a little homework and coming back. Yeah, I mean, when you come to the four-star level, it's a different it's a different game because it keeps coming at you. You don't get the breaks in the middle like at a three-star level or even the two-star level. You don't get the breaks in the middle of the combinations this one you got to you got to keep coming you got to keep coming you got to keep coming and um so it always, uh, sometimes, you know, it's the thing about running a sport like this. When you're doing it, you're, you know, kind of putting all of your questions out there. And sometimes you don't get the answer that you were looking for. Um, and you got to go back and think about it. And that's the, that's the cool thing about sporting world. Not just horse world, but sporting world, you know. Well, speaking of sporting world and, and kind of your philosophy behind what it goes into to be successful, you've talked a lot about how you have to study the game. You have to look at game tape regardless of you're a football player, a baseball player, or an 
equestrian and you've instilled that into the program this far and, and kind of with the riders that you've worked with so far and the training sessions that you guys have done have you been happy with those and, and the progress that's been made so far on on the road to kind of the next four years yeah I mean it, I think the first year was this year is very much about creating a place to start from you know trying to get a language in the training sessions because I, I believe that the technical riding you know needed to raise a little bit um, you know we've got great instinctual riders as we've seen here today um, and so the technical side of the riding has uh, been improving and it's been a very open conversation back and forth um, we use a lot of video you know we use uh, video on the on the iPads to see things um, that we study and will study um, these tapes um, we have all the dressage tapes you know done we'll study those in the off season so it is a constant process and again it's a good place to start but I, I, what I'm excited about is that one I've seen the riders try some of the things that we've been working on in the winter so and that's been very very good um, and um, and they've been very very open um, to conversation so we have a lot of buy-in um, so that really means that from this starting of a step I really really believe that the success is going to come and I actually I probably shouldn't say this, but I probably think the success is going to come a little sooner than what I was originally thinking. Um, and that's we're going to go to Europe and um, hammer at that a little bit, too. Um, and um, so I, I actually feel quite I feel very confident, you know, but it's got to be a step by step program. Part of that stepping stone process is is the young younger riders, the so 25 and under. And maybe there's been some changes in how that's all set up. You've worked with those youngsters a lot. Maybe some surprises of what they didn't know, or some some surprises the other way of things that maybe they impressed you a little more than you thought they would. Or yeah, that. and then some of them are here, right? We got Caitlin here, right, who came out of the under 25. Uh, we got Megan Donahue who's coming later. She was under the under 25. I walked the under 25 kids that are here, um, all wearing their jackets. Uh, we walk, We went around the course this morning, you know, to, to kind of say, all right, this is what it is and this is where we're going to go. So it's an important part of the program. We're going to start an under-18 class, too, you know, and um, start the education at that level. Um, so it is, uh, I think it's an important part of it. And um, certainly, you know, these two, these under-25 riders that are here riding a four, four start. I mean, Caitlin's shown herself exceptionally well so far um, in this, and I would concede that. And, I, and I'm looking forward. I thought Megan Donahue rode a fantastic dress test because that horse you know, I mean it's it, it doesn't move so well <laughs> in the trot it doesn't have a big trot um, and uh, I, I didn't think that Megan gave away a point yesterday and it was such a classy ride um, and we're looking for that again this afternoon. She's a very, very classy rider. We look, I really look forward to the future. So I'm actually, that's kind of the side of the future I'm actually quite excited about. And then just with that other group, kind of some some team building things you've done or some ways you've looked at changing the program a little bit so that they're more of more united and more going in as we're a team instead of, okay, we're everyone for themselves, fight to get in. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer in the team aspect. I think the, um, you know, I think fighting for each other on any team is is something that you can rely on. I was that way when I was a rider. I was that way when I was ca captain of the team when we were doing it. I mean, it was very much that we were coming in this together. We're going to go up and we're going to we're going to go down together. Um, and so, you, I think you set that attitude a little bit from the start. Um, you set that attitude of how you deal with things. Uh, we had a big reach out to the owners, uh, big reach out, every, including the grooms, including the vets, and really trying to get the whole program get. In and believe in the programs and I think that's what creates the buy-in and and supporting each other which I think is important when you get down to a championship level one of the things that the riders have seemed to be really welcoming of is your your take on welcoming in their coaches too and that kind of wasn't really there in the past you you kind of would work with with um, the coach here or there but not with working together as a team and in all the training sessions I've been to I've seen you there with the coach you know what do they do when you do this this is how I would do this and how important do you feel that is moving forward that everybody's on the same page because you can't be there every well, day well I think that's the point of it is that you're not going to be I mean you're going to see them three or four times you know in the east coast west coast it's a big huge country you're not going to be able to go all the competitions you're not going to be there all the time and so it's really trying to upgrade and make sure that the coaches that are with them on an everyday basis the person that they see every week is that we're all talking about the same thing and so it's not about trying to replace their personal coaches at all it's actually trying to make sure that we're all seeing the same thing and trying to go about it and that those coaches know what the level that I'm looking for and what where how we would plan that rider on a step by 
step-by-step basis to get to that level. You know, whether it's a technical thing or a philosophical thing or a way to deal with this horse um, or just even a technical riding thing. And so I think that language is really, really important to get into. Um, so the working with all of the coaches and we do all these training sessions together, I think that's how the program's going to go because you just can't, you can't wait for me to show up. I mean, I'm, it's not going to be, it's not going to be there enough. The country's too big. <laughs> the country's too big. So, and we'll get into even having other coaches later on. So it's, and then again, it's, this is a, this year is about the start. Right. And then just, you've focused so much as well on fundamentals, just taking it back to basics for a second. And I think that when riders get to this level, you forget that they go home every day and they have practice every day and they work on things every day. And for the spectators here, we just see them in these big moments, but have you talked with them about kind of their plans on a daily basis and, and what in your opinion makes success coming from that side? Well, I, I'm a, obviously a big, huge believer in the fundamentals, and I and I really do. I like I think it's any sport, like it's soccer, or baseball, or football. Everybody, you go back, you spend time on the whiteboard, you spend time looking at tape of yourself and seeing that in that instinctual moment, my technique is wrong. You know, I do this aid or that. So they, what you were trying to get done is correct, but what the way that you were doing is incorrect, and that actually caused the problem for the horse not to understand what he's supposed to do. So, um, but understanding that at first, if you don't recognize it, you can't fix it so the first thing is to try to get them to recognize it and then they'll do with their own drive with riders that are as talented as this you know with their, their own drive will help them fix it but you got to get them to recognize and see that it could be something small and technical that is actually causing some of the problems and and holding them back so i think the fundamentals are really really important in any sport a lot not just ours which we have a fundamental technique from our point of view and a, and a technique from the horse's point of view. So, um, and I, like I said, I think we're very, very strong on the instinct side, um, but on the theoretical technical side, I don't think we're as strong. And, and I believe that we, and we're getting beat by countries that are. And so I really do believe that we have to go down there and, and work on that. The riders have been very receptive of that. Um, and then when they have that and their instincts are kicking on, like you're seeing today, some of those, um, it's that's when the success is gonna come. So. Going back to the basics is, I think, very, very important. And I think the higher the level you go, the more you end up working on the simple things um, in any sport, right? And uh, so that's it's always keeping coming forward is, are my, are my fundamentals correct? So I don't have to think of them when I'm out here in comp competing. In other countries, there's a lot of schooling programs, you know, colleges, or, or you go and you practice equestrian sports in school. Our country doesn't have that so much, but certain programs are starting to develop that. Do you think that that will be something in the near future that there will be more kids going to college who can learn about being a true equestrian? Yeah, I mean, I think the college programs are really, really useful for a number of different ways on all aspects of the industry, you know, whether you be a stable manager or a vet tech or a, you know, a, or a bar manager, not just a rider or a teacher. Um, right now, a lot of the colleges, because just because of finance, is a little bit more into the hunter industry, just because it's one of the easier ones, but the dressage part is taking off and taking off strong. Um, the eventing is harder just because of the cost of it, you know, just the capital cost of it. Um, but I think the, one of the weaknesses that we have here in in this country that we don't that they have in Europe is they have a center you know Germany has Varndorf or France has Samir or I um, mean um, Italy has Bertoni and so they, these are centers where everybody comes to we don't really have that and um, you know someday I think we could come back to that some you know to, for an education on the education side you know uh, especially with the younger riders I think that would be very very important you know for the in the future. So David O'Connor believes in education as well. We had some controversy going on in the other couch sessions because Boyd said, if you're a good rider, don't go to college. It will wreck you. And then we, then that, before that, I had Lynn Samansky and Aaron Sylvester, who are both college graduates, on the couch. So they were saying, you should definitely go to college no matter what. So very differing views. Yeah, I, know, cause I, didn't, I didn't end up, well, I dropped out of college to, to go to the team. But And I think one of the things is that if you are going to be a rider and you want to be a good rider, when you apprentice, yourself to the best that you can find now you're in college and you have to treat it like that or else you can't just go to ride and whatever you have to go because I'm there to learn a craft and um, and I think that's the way to look at it if you could give young riders some advice what would it be kind of as far as what they can do to help better themselves to the best of their abilities at, at a younger age 
Well, I mean, obviously, I'm going to talk about the fundamentals, <laughs> um, the basics and the fundamentals. I think that are learned, and also be diverse in how you learn about horsemanship. You know, not just get stuck in the vending. If I had my, if I had actually my, you know, millions of dollars in the ultimate way in a program, I would take probably most 18 and 19 year olds and, and get them to stop eventing the good cross country riders and I would send them to a true dressage barn in Europe and, and a jumper barn and I would have them do dressage for a year and jumpers for a year I mean they good jumpers meter 40 meter 50 stuff um, and then I would bring them when they were 20 years old I'd bring them back in the venting that would be my ideal plan I have no way to do that but that would you know so the diversification is really really important of true of the aspects of of, of horsemanship um, and uh, that's the way this sport is it's it's very technical um, the, the guys the top guys are really 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 good and so if you were to education I would I would diversify and always 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 put yourself around the best people that you can find great example of that probably would be Marilyn Little she's done so Absolutely. well in the show jumping ring and now she's here doing so well and it seemed like she made that transition relatively easily yeah well she's very brave <laughs> and uh, and she's a she's a fantastic cross country rider I mean she's got good horses but if you actually watch her go cross country your horses always get out there at a, at a good gallop they're always in fantastic balance and she's got a real sense for that you know the dressage has been the harder thing for her to learn um, and that's getting better and better on a month by month basis um, but the jumping thing she's I mean, she'll run down to something, and the horses are always in a fantastic balance. And you watch it, and the horses are always studying the fences. And uh, because I think of her technique and the quality that she has between what she does with her hands and how she does it with her body, like the Andrews, like the Williams, she has that type of quality to it. So, I mean, you're going to hear Marilyn's name a lot in the future. I mean, she's going to win, and she'll, she'll be great for the States. Well, Marilyn has a hurt shoulder, for those of you who don't know, and she, you'll see her walking around with a sling, and then she takes it off and does did one of the best dressage tests here yesterday. Yeah, she's so. tough. I mean, and our, you know, our doctor's working with her, and so they feel like she has the ability to do that with Mark Hart, um, our team doctor, and so it's it's within the parameters, but, you know, it's one of those things. I only need 10 minutes. Not you know? only no, brave, actually, but yeah, tough. Yeah, she's tough. You know, like you said, all right, I need 11 minutes and 21 seconds. That's all I need, and, uh, and then put it back on. But um, she'll go out there and give it her all. Her all. And I, I don't think it's a safety thing at all. Um, she, she'll be sore at the end of it, but she'll she'll get it out. And, I, and the mayor is a very good mayor. Um, so I would say that she would have a good ride today. I hope she has a good ride today. There's been a lot of questions on our Twitter, on the Rolex Kentucky Twitter. And they've been asking over and over, what do you think makes a good young horse coming up? And with you taking a look at this program and the young horses that are going to be needed to be future stars, down the road, what do you look at? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I really rate their paces in some ways. You know, the walk and the canter is still going to be the most important thing. The, the walk is, I mean, and the canter has got to be a 7 8 class. Don't buy a weak canter, period. Yeah. Just don't do it. Um, you can buy a little bit of a weaker trot and because that will could get better, but a weak canter, don't just don't go there. And then I think it's uh, curiosity, you know, natural kind of athleticism and, and curiosity for the horses, you know. And the other thing is that are they, they're actually, are they trainable? You know, it's the buying the dingbat off the, you know, off of some person's field and thinking that you're always going to make it better. There are always exceptions to the rule when it happens, <laughs> um, but there are exceptions to a rule. Um, so buy something that has a mind that you can that you can work with, and um, you know, with uh, especially with different people at different levels. I'm a big believer in that. You know, um, and so that kind of that young horse, you know, very very good canter, a good walk, you know, a, a or or a great canter, great walk. A good trot um, and then a, a natural jumping ability and an inquisitiveness to do things I think that's the I think those are the keys to me or a horse that really looks okay you know what are we gonna do um, and uh, it's n not the one that's brave that's running at everything that's that doesn't mean that's not brave to me you know but the horse that actually looks at something and said oh I yeah we can we'll do this together so and then getting back to the course at hand today, Derek has done a fantastic job over the last four, four years in making this course his own. But it feels like this year, it's really a Derek Gracia course. He's put his stamp on it. He's made kind of final changes to the things that were remaining from a few years ago. And what are your thoughts on, on the work Derek's done here? And you've seen four stars all over the world, obviously. So how does this one compare in your mind? Yeah, I think it's very good. I don't think it, this year, I don't know if it's the hardest um, four star in the world because I actually think he's done an experiment I think he really wanted to know what when you go into the infield and then you come back out up into the top of the water and then you go back in the infield and you do two coffins 
what's that going to affect? And I think he softened up the end of it because he didn't want to pay both sides. And so next year, I, there's going to be a tweak. <laughs> And um, and I see the next year's course is going to be you know that that much tougher. But he played an experiment, and I thought he played the experiment totally right by saying, "Okay, I'm going to put it harder here. I want to see what it does. I'm going to go softer here because the horses were quite tired here in the last two or three years. And you're not I haven't seen a tired horse realistically almost all day today, which is fantastic. Uh, and um, so he had the adjustment, and I think he did it right. And now he'll have the confidence to say, "Okay, yes, I actually can go up Watch a notch here too." <laughs> right. So um, you know things like maybe the 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 uh, bounce bank you know the normandy bank you know putting that corner back to where it was last year on the three stride or maybe some combination after the water last water you know there'll be little things like that last year it felt like a few times riders got to the end and you thought they were going to make it home for sure and then they came off or they had right. the 20 or they just didn't make it back so he softened it up this year and and yeah, we're I you softened it up that time made the beginning harder and um and i think that balance was something he was playing with and it was a very good way to do it and now he can now he can play or tweak for this later group, ones that you think will have great rides or hope will have great rides and you'll be looking to as future team members? Well, there's no question I am, um, you know, we're, I would be looking for Maryland, you know, for the U.S. You know, I would look for Maryland to have a good ride and buck on his horse, you know, to, that horse is towards the end of his career. But Bally No Castle would be great to see that one really come out of his four-star and go. But trading aces for Boyd's horse, it's a younger horse. It'll be his first four-star. Be interesting to see his gallop. I think it's, a, per nine. it's a perfect horse for this horse for, the, for where he is in his education. So I think that is pretty good. But I'll say something about Aaron Sylvester yesterday. She had the horses just melted, and I really believe I think Aaron's a very good rider, and she ought to have a great course, cross country course today. And the horse just panicked yesterday, and we have to put him in different environments because she rode the last four days. I thought as good as anybody preparing that horse, and going into the warm up, that horse was absolutely perfect. He was great, and he went down there, and he didn't. He didn't screw her over. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. He wasn't bad. He panicked. And um, he just wanted to get out of there. And um, I really, I felt so sorry for her because there's nothing, you can't get after him about him and you couldn't correct him. I and mean, he just literally panicked and I felt so sorry for her. I would expect to see that she's gonna have a very good ride this afternoon. And then the plan for her would be to go, well, let's go and put him in bigger environments. So let's go to Devon Dressage. You know, let's go down to, a I mean, down to Wellington and to put him into that type of arena situation. So he realizes that it's not a scary thing to be out there in the middle of the grandstand because he really, really Really panicked yesterday. I asked Aaron, or Aaron, I asked Andrew um, yesterday, chatting with him about bringing horses up through the levels when they're young and then they get here. I think in the U.S., one of the things we don't have as much of is those big environments. Right. So you hope it will react well and you think it will kind of coming down that ramp into the main arena but is there other preparations when they're younger or things you've done in the past that have helped aside from like well, you're I saying think, taking I think them a lot of it can. is putting them into environments you know where there's not a lot of pressure you know so you're not just leaving it for Rolex um, you know in Europe by the time these young horses have gotten here they've already probably been in four big stadiums and so they've realized that it's just you know it's just work you know it's just an everyday work it doesn't make any difference um, we don't have have that case over here but you but we do if you on the east coast you do if you look at it right again Devin, you know that's got a grandstand looking there here um you know for dressage shows here at kentucky and during the summer um so at wellington so there are different environments i think you can go into that you for a horse like that has to go in there and just not just do a training level test i mean he doesn't have to do anything big so it's just that is he realizes that all those people out there are not going to eat him <laughs> well, Which is what he thinks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, hopefully he doesn't think that today in the galloping lanes. But Aaron Sylvester's been around here last year very successfully, as well as overseas. So we'll hope for that for her. And before we take questions from the audience, I have to ask you: Do you who do you think is going to win it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I would say that uh, Williams, we would hope an American. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. But I think the Chilly Morning Horse looks good. I know he has a little bit of a run out every once in a while, and if it and if it does rain, that'll change you know a little bit at the end of the day so but you'd have to say it's going to you know between william and andrew those horses those horses look good the guys are riding classy it's going to be one of those two guys and you know they're not the best pals in the world so you know they go after each other they go after each other on an every 
weekend basis. And um, with money at stake to talk about. Don't, don't be thinking that they're not thinking that right now. They're they're going after each other. Not they're not the best of friends. No. They have, and they have, they have tremendous respect for each other, but they're not the best of friends. And and they hammer at each other all the time. Right. Which is why you know when you look at the level of their riding, you know they push each other. Andrew's riding now better. In this last six years, Andrew's riding better now than when I was competing against him 20 years ago. He's riding better now in his 50s than he was in his 30s. Um, and that's a conscious, he made that decision. He consciously thought about it, changed a little bit the type of horses he has, went after the dressage, and now he's truly, I think, you know, one of the best in the world between the two of them. Um, uh, overall, and that was a conscious decision of his. And he's, uh, like I said, I think he's riding better now than he was when I was competing against him for a long time. Um, and he was. You can great always then. make yourself better. He can always make if you commit to it, and he is 100 percent committed. And Americans, you think we'll see towards the top ten there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely think. Uh, hopefully, you'll see Maryland up there. You know, I think she'll give him a good run for money, and then obviously with her show jumping, uh, she'll be close. I don't know if she can make up the point difference, but uh, she sh hopefully she'll be in the top, you know, four or five. Um, and you know, Bucks, you know, in a good place um, with that Mar de and I think he could be if he has a good run on Valley. I think he'll be up there in the running. And I would see that probably what you're fighting for is third, you know, third, fourth in there, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, if they did, that would be a good. That would be a good to be sitting around the, you know, behind, right behind the top two in the world for right now. You know, and then two years ago, two years from now, it's gonna flip. <laughs> it's gonna they'll, be, they'll be looking at a U.S. tail. Yeah. Allie Knowles <laughs> is doing her first four star here. She had a great dressage test. Were you surprised at how well she scored? No, or? I mean I know that I've been watching Allie for a long time, and she's very, very classic. She's very good, v extremely cool-headed rider. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see. The only weakness maybe with this horse is whether it'll run all the way around and it's you know, with its speed, but it should jump around. Um, whether it can come inside the time, well, I just have to see. But this is a perfect course for that. But Allie is going to be around for a long time. She's here at Kentucky. Um, she is a classy, classy rider and, like I said, an extremely cool-headed person. Yeah. So, again, I think this is just a start for her career. She came out of that ring yesterday and, and she knew she had kind of nailed it, except for that last movement at the end. But you see, still saw Allie walk out, typical Allie. She just calmly walks over to Buck and said, D was it okay? Yeah. And he said, well, we yeah, spent, I we think it was last, okay. Yeah, we spent the last three or four minutes with her before they like it, and she's standing there on a loose rein. I used to do that with custom made all the time. He's standing there on a loose rein. They're like, okay, one minute to go. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess I ought to pick up the reins now. And it just goes down there and <laughs> nails a test. So, you know, she, she has a tremendous amount of confidence in it. And she knows what she's doing. She's very technically correct. Um, and, again, she's got a great cool head. So you'll, you'll hear about her a lot in the next 10 years, that's for sure. All right. Well, Allie goes first after this lunch break, so you can head on back and, and check her out. She's a Kentucky local now. We lost her on the West Coast where I'm from. But um, she's out here and doing fantastic thus far here. So we're going to go ahead and take some questions from the audience um, come on forward and feel free to ask a question to David don't be scared he's not very mean I promise <laughs> I'll not, protect you not very mean. <laughs> not very mean <laughs> anyone have a question oh come on there you go go for it um, so like when you're coming to this four star what's the day-to-day -day workload that these horses have to endure in preparation for yeah, the question really was what you know. Really, what are the horses? What's their workload as they come up and how they do this? You know, it really started back in December where the horses starting to get ready of 30, 45 after the vacations of 30, 45 days of trotting and light flat work and stuff. And the true work they would start galloping probably at the end of January and they would just do uh, about eight weeks of uh, just road you know kind of road work. What do we call you know three times a mile, three times a mile and a quarter, three times a mile and a half, and they would get up to that kind of almost three times to two miles um, once or twice a week and that would end then uh, roughly at the end of March and then they would start to do speed speed work you know and they're trotting 45 minutes of uh, you know uh, once or twice a week also that's on top of their dressage work or their or their show dummy work so by the time they get here they're really really fit but as with anything we're trying to get the guys to like with the top uh, racetrack horses and uh, and swimmers um, and track and field they actually start to taper here in the last 10 days you know so your peak fitness 
of your work would end about 10 days ago, right? And then you really start to taper so that they come here real fit and strong and feeling like they're they're all they're going. I was amazed when I went to the Olympic Games that in the last 10 days, you know, that you can't find any of the swimmers that are in the pool or they're sleeping. That's the only two things that they do. They're in the pool or they sleep. And they're sleeping a lot. And they said so that tapering thing is a big part of that swimmers or track and field guys. So we apply the same thing to the horses. We asked some of the other riders what they their kind of pre-game ritual is and what was yours before cross country. <laughs> I was yeah, mine was always I was try to get off to be really quiet. You know, I was I got pretty insular and I was you know, always kind of had my headphones on and would kind of go off into my own world. My grooms would just there were the girl people that were working for me. They would, you know, they would see me when I would come to ride. <laughs> and um, you know, I always had a little bit get off in uh, my own little world. That became easier as it, later on my career you know with that switch used to take me maybe I would be an hour or an hour and a half you know to turn the switch on to get ready you know I felt at the end of my career in those last two or three years that switch could go on in five minutes and you'd and you'd actually be in the same place because you're more confident so but turning that switch on to where that you don't see the rest of the world um, is an important part of it so some people sleep some people when eat, some people, right? yeah, she just takes sleep, a nap. yeah yeah that's the nerves next question What age was I when I started riding? My mother put me on the first horse when I was about eight. Um, and then uh, then I got lucky, I got to do a lot of different things. And uh, when I was a kid, um, uh, you know, I was in Pony Club, and we did that, that type of thing, uh, but didn't really specialize. Um, and um, and so I, I, was, I started about then, and, but I played a lot when I was, you know, it wasn't it wasn't all just being in a ring. We did a lot of stuff with horses and, and you know enjoyed it. So yeah. Next question. Well the rider positions you'll see a similarity of where you know that they're all balanced over over their leg, you know, or, or, you know, just like when you're standing there. But it really varies very much on to um, you know, what type of body style you are. The difference between a William Fox Pitt and a Caitlin Stillman, right? Caitlin's, you know, five four and William's six four. So they have very, very different styles. I think one of the big things that you really think about is that the quiet the, the, the most effective ones are the most that keep their upper bodies quiet. And um, you know, they use their weight instead of the weight at the end of the reins instead of using their hands by themselves and um, those are always the most effective riders the most quiet you could be so the horse can study the puzzle that's in front of them and see it you know and if they see it and they understand it then you can then you can support them what they're trying to do so uh, the, the, the quietness of it is the most important thing I was a B pony clubber yep I was a B pony clubber I wasn't good enough to be an A. We had Allie in here yesterday, and she's an A. And then, then I asked Holly what she was, and she said, I was a B. <laughs> yeah. But then they went out in the Pony Club games, and Allie fell off. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I did this yeah, four or five years ago, and I almost fell off. These ponies are quick for an old person to try to get on, because you get up to the end of it, and you go to vault on them, which I don't vault as fast as I was when I was 11 years old, and the pony's already gone. And I, I remember coming down here. I was behind the saddle. Thank God the horse had a, the pony had a mane that was out like this because that is the only thing I had to hold on and I went all the way down the end just trying to get back in the saddle. <laughs> I don't well, do the pony club games anymore. You might see some more <laughs> it's dangerous. stuff in the raining tonight. <laughs> yeah, I need like a hit air vest before I'm going to go in pony club here. <laughs> Pony club games were way different. The, the, you know the litter pickup that they do? Everybody goes down there and they pick up a little milk carton and then they come back with their polo mallet. When I was a kid, it was a pile of trash out in the middle of the ring. They blew a whistle. Four kids with mallets right, all go into the middle of the ring together. And whoever, they blew the whistle five minutes later and whoever had the most trash in their basket. <laughs> Those were games. <laughs> like hunger Pushing games. Pushing them out of the way. <laughs> yeah, it's like pony club hunger games. <laughs> more questions anybody else Oh, which horse did I enjoy eventing the most? I, I really couldn't tell you. Um, you know, there'd be, there'd be really talented horses that you guys don't really know about. Um, you know, we, everyone was so different with, a, with these horses that were here at Rolex. You know, the Rattlin' Hum was the fastest thing I ever read in my life. 
you know, you could go a thousand meters a minute whenever you wanted, um, you know, and and turn the key off. Custom made, you could go a thousand meters a minute, but then the key got stuck. Um, you know, so they were all they're all so different. You know, so I don't know. It's like picking a child. I don't know if there's a favorite, um, but they were all so different. Um, but you know, I had great horses and you know got to have a good career. You know, especially here, I felt like I grew up here on this on this park. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're going to let David head off and watch the second group of riders here this afternoon, but thanks so much for sitting down and chatting with us. All right, fine. Thank you. Everybody enjoy their day.